which is based on a very interesting book, uh, How Did This Happen? And the book is interesting in many ways. Uh, it's interesting if you read it, you'll find you, there's some very good essays in it. It's also interesting in the fact that it came out in very short order. Um, as somebody who started writing my own uh, book, which has just come out, uh, Paradox of American Power, I started that a year ago, and I thought it was really short timing. Uh, I think Gideon and his boss, Jim Hogue, talked to me about this in late September, and uh, by mid-November, the book was out. But it was not only out, but it was extremely well edited. And as anyone who knows who has tried to get academics or others to, to uh, cooperate, uh, the length of time it takes to publish anything is directly related to the number of people, perhaps exponentially related. And yet Gideon and Jim Hogue managed to get this book out in no time. But the secret was very draconian editing. Uh, they edited the chapters, made them make sense, and then told the authors, this is going in by Friday unless we hear from you. And you usually got that about Tuesday. <laughs> so Gideon Rose uh, has produced, and, and Jim Hogue have produced an extraordinarily interesting book on the events after September 11th, and I urge you all to, to look at it. Uh, my job is simply to introduce Gideon, and then he will introduce the other panelists, and we'll have a conversational type discussion. But uh, Gideon is a man who has many talents. As I just described, he's a superb editor, and is indeed the the managing editor of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he's also a man who has served on the National Security Council in the White House. And he is also a very fine teacher of American foreign policy, having taught at Columbia and Princeton. But before that, he taught at Harvard. And this is a secret that I can tell. In all my years of teaching at Harvard, I have never seen anybody who taught in a large course who got a straight 5.0 on a five-point scale for the quality of his teaching, except for Gideon Rose. With that, Gideon, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joe. Um, <clears throat> with the book editing, it was actually kind of funny. At one point, very much towards the end of the process, I nearly had a heart attack because of the time we had to um, send all the material back and forth among ourselves and our proofreaders and uh, the authors uh, by email as attachments and making changes on the files sort of seriatim uh, as it went through the process. And when one of our authors, uh, a rather prickly fellow, uh, got his chapter with the instructions, as Joe said, to basically accept <laughs> uh, and sign on the dotted line, uh, he said, that's great. I accept most of the changes. There are one or two here. And I really like this innovation that you've uh, introduced of showing uh, where you've changed things. And I nearly, my heart leapt to my throat. And it turns out there was a feature in Microsoft Word that I hadn't known about that allows you to sort of keep a running track record of the changes that have been made to uh, the document. And someone had turned this on unintentionally. <laughs> and uh, our author, at least the first couple of authors, got their pieces back with the changes marked on them. And as any the first rule of editing everyone knows is you never let the author see what you've done. You just make them work from the new text. Uh, and that way they, they, uh, are, they swallow the changes you've made more easily. And luckily, we managed to catch those in print. So I think yours actually just it was wonderful, Joe. It didn't need any changes at all. <laughs> Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here. It does feel rather strange uh, coming back here, having weird flashbacks to graduate school, uh, where I, I taught for, for Joe. And I kind of feel like I should tell you what the sections are and, and the reading is available at the COOP uh, and, uh, and on reserve. Uh, we have a wonderful panel tonight. Um, the events of September 11th were traumatic and horrifying, and they have been near perhaps world historical in their import in terms of what has followed as well. They also have brought forth, I think, uh, a new seriousness of purpose among students of foreign policy and among the public uh, and a new interest in serious discussion of uh, various kinds of, of, of issues related to the attacks. And in that context, it's wonderful to be able to showcase 
in a culture that is increasingly concerned with celebrities and uh, sound bites and so forth, people who actually know what they're talking about. And that is our panel tonight. Uh, all of them have chapters in the book, and I urge you to read them, but all of them are not primarily authors. They are primarily substantive experts of one kind or another. Uh, Brian Jenkins is one of the world's leading authorities on terrorism. He has studied the subject uh, on all sides, uh, from the operational, where he was a uh, captain in the Green Berets at one point, uh, to the academic, uh, where he was the, I think, the founder of the RAND uh, terrorism yes. program. Uh, and uh, he's worked at uh, Kroll Associates uh, in the private security uh, consulting field, uh, and is now back at RAND as a senior advisor to the president, and is, is the author of perhaps the single best soundbite in the history of terrorism studies, which is the notion that sort of at least old-fashioned terrorists uh, wanted a lot of people watching, not a lot of people dead. Although you may have to revise that, I think you already have. Um, and uh, Brian really is, I think, one of the two or three leading experts on all aspects of terrorism, counterterrorism, in the country today. Uh, Mona Sutphin <coughs> has had an extraordinarily distinguished career for such a young woman, uh, at uh, uh, primarily at the State Department, but also at the National Security Council, uh, and now recently in the private sector. Uh, she has served in uh, a variety of key hotspots and key positions and worked on issues ranging from human rights to uh, international economic policy uh, to Iraq to the former uh, Yugoslavia uh, and its various conflicts. Um, she's currently at Stonebridge uh, consulting uh, and is working very closely with Sandy Berger. Uh, and you followed, did you follow Sandy out of? No, actually, I left, uh, when you I left I left before him. Uh, a key player in the, uh, in the last years of the Clinton administration. Also, Joe Nye, who is, of course, familiar to all of you, <coughs> and is a, uh, not just my ex-teacher, uh, which, of course, is his greatest badge of honor, <coughs> but um, the, the, uh, a distinguished scholar of international relations and various policy issues, as well as a, uh, a practitioner with service not just at the State Department, but at the Department of Defense and in the intelligence community, sort of the model of the, uh, the person who combines uh, practice and scholarship uh, in, in a way that all the younger uh, generations and echelons uh, aspire to, uh, and, and a, perhaps the single person <clears throat> best able to reduce complex events to a clear, precise uh, formula that I've ever, ever seen. With that, let me start by asking a few questions of our panelists. I'll go in order across. We'll have a rather loose and formal discussion. Then we'll have a Q&A. Turn it over to you so you can have your comments. Um, and we'll have a very frank, free discussion. Uh, <clears throat> I should say, by the way, that uh, Richard Butler, some of you might know, was supposed to be here. He unfortunately couldn't be here uh, because of illness. Um, but he sends his, uh, he sends his regrets. Brian. Um, you knew there was a threat before September 11th. Uh, you were warning about it, along with a few others. You knew a lot about Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda. What have we learned? A lot of us learned a lot from what happened about the threat that was there. What have the professionals and the people who actually knew things before September 11th learned from what's happened and the various intelligence that's been gathered? Well, I think, first of all, September 11th um, has to be seen as, as not a, a one-time anomaly, but rather as underscoring some of the trends that we had been watching uh, for a while. In fact, one of those relates back to the, uh, the comment you made in your introduction regarding uh, my phrase that, that uh, terrorists had always, we had known, had the capacity to kill more uh, than they did if, if murder, if mass slaughter was, was their, their sole objective. The fact that they did not do so could not be explained by some type of technological ceiling, but could only be explained in terms of self-imposed constraints. And over the years, uh, through interrogation of terrorists, through interviews, uh, we were able to discern that, in fact, there were self-imposed constraints. They worried about the cohesion of their organization. They worried about not alienating perceived constituents. Uh, they worried about not provoking a kind of public backlash or the kind of government reaction that the 
that the organization might not uh, survive. But um, in the 19, late 1980s and 1990s, we began to observe what could be described as an erosion of those self-imposed constraints as terrorists moved uh, away from political agendas and into the realm of ideologies that were based upon religion, which reduced some of the constraints that might have been imposed either by uh, morality or uh, simply some of the constraints that might have been imposed, uh, imposed by concerns about secular constituencies. Now, that's a key point here, and the reason I want to make it is, is that it is at the same time too easy to say, to explain the kind of dramatic violence we saw on September 11th, where clearly the intent was was uh, uh, casualties of catastrophic proportions. And to see the kinds of things that are coming out of the manuals that have been recovered in Afghanistan are urging uh, the, the, the students in these training camps to think in terms of killing in, in a large scale. It, it's easy to dismiss that as a function of religion. And one of the things that I think is, is, is a concern is that in fact, there may be a constituency for that, a constituency that they are appealing to, which has a lot higher tolerance for extreme levels of violence than we may have thought. In other words, it's one thing to say, well, these are religious fanatics who believe sincerely they are doing the bidding of God. It's more frightening to say that there is a high degree of tolerance and approval for, for violence at that level, and indeed an exhortation and an expectation. And that's why I think uh, September 11th is, is, is going to have profound effects. It has not only demonstrated vulnerabilities, it has not only uh, raised the bar, in a sense, for, for the members of Al-Qaeda, but it has, I think, uh, raised the bar uh, for terrorists overall and that uh, large-scale indiscriminate violence is more likely to be the reality of terrorism going forward. Sure, to be sure, some groups still will operate under the, under the self-imposed constraints, but large-scale violence is likely to be the reality of terrorism uh, as, as we go forward. And that really underlines uh, a longer term trend. And that is because of that, because of the vulnerabilities in our society, uh, power, and here I mean power defined in a, in a crude sense as simp simply the capacity to kill, to destroy, to disrupt, to force us to divert vast resources to security, that that power is descending to smaller and smaller groups. Or to put it another way, that the small bands of irreconcilables, of fanatics, of, of, of lunatics, uh, who have existed throughout society and whose grievances, real or imaginary, it's not going to be always possible to satisfy, have become an increasingly potent force to be recognized, uh, to be reckoned with. And how we, uh, we as a democratic society, are going to deal with that and, and hopefully remain a democratic society, I think is one of the major challenges we face at the beginning of this century. Do you think the threat is, I mean, if, if, in, if in some ways September 11th revealed a threat that had existed rather than creating a new one, uh, since then there's been not just a demonstration of what can be done to us, but also the demonstration of what we can do to our enemies. At the end of the day, net net, uh, are we more vulnerable now, less vulnerable? Which demonstration effect is more important? It, 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 there's a balance sheet, and, and the balance sheet is, is not going to be, uh, however, toted up neatly in terms of, of uh, a, a, at the end, uh, a, a win or a loss. I mean, to be sure, we have, we have destroyed the Taliban as a government, uh, and that is important because it provided geographic asylum to the, to the Al Qaeda network. We have put Al Qaeda on the run. We probably have put, um, my guess would be, about a 20% dent in its leadership. Uh, there have been approximately 1,000 arrests of Al Qaeda 
al-Qaeda operatives worldwide. Some of those have to be discounted because some of them are, are, were individuals under suspicion uh, that were uh, left in place because authorities were watching to see who they might contact and to learn more about them. That became a dangerous strategy after September 11th, and so a lot of people were rounded up. Uh, but that also breaks some of the connections that we, we, we might want to know about. We have uh, certainly put um, increased pressure on their, on their finances. I'm not sure we can squeeze that down enough to actually prevent terrorist operations. We probably can, uh, by, by stemming the flow of, of tens of millions of dollars, can probably interrupt some of their activities in terms of supporting uh, the fundamentalist schools in Pakistan in running the training camps, which they no longer have to run, in providing large sums to the Taliban to support them, which they no longer have to do. Can we really squeeze that down far enough to get into the realm that they can't put together an operation that costs several hundred thousand dollars, uh, which is roughly the, the investment of September 11th on their part? I'm, I'm more doubtful about that. I think the threat remains uh, extremely high. Now, as to, uh, they have operational capability, but this might be transformed in different ways. We, we, we are not going to see the big funneling of, of um, those who are most committed into training camps into Afghanistan where they are not simply trained, but it's an important socializing experience. It's, it's an experience that, that it, it creates a network of relationships. We may not see that taking place. We may see something that is, uh, becomes more autonomous locally. Uh, one form it may take uh, in, in the future that as uh, these arrests themselves uh, send a number of the people scurrying back to countries that they came from, we may see, in a sense, uh, a metastasizing of, 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 uh, of this, away from the kind of coalescence and, and, and conflation of these various galaxies. And I, 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 I want to pick my language carefully here, and, and you'll note that I do use terms like galaxies and constellations as opposed to groups, because that's, that's what we're dealing with here. We're not dealing with something that can be easily defined on a, on a chart on the wall as we do order of battle intelligence. Uh, this is much more of a network. So the network, what, what will happen here is not simply that they have been uh, hurt badly, they have, they have been hurt to be sure, but that the pressure that we have created on them will cause them to mutate into different organizational forms which will have operational implications. But as for the threat to us, the threat remains extremely high of large-scale actions, uh, both uh, uh, here and abroad. I cannot believe that, that uh, al-Qaeda planned uh, September 11th to be its final act. And I'm also convinced that they had two plans the day before September 11th. One was the plan for the attack, and the other was a business continuity plan. So I don't think we... Uh, we have heard the last from the leadership that was responsible for moving the resources that supported that particular attack. Brian, so cheery. I always like to start with him. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mona, the last years of the Clinton administration were, I wouldn't say consumed, but were noted for their uh, obsession with Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda in some quarters. Uh, was there was the real transition here 911 or Janu late January uh, 2001. Was there continuity between the Bush and Clinton approaches to counterterrorism uh, before 911? And how would the Clinton administration or our Gore administration uh, perhaps have acted after 911? In effect, is the is the threat and the revelation of that threat through acts such as the attacks? what has been driving American policy, or has it been the policy makers who have chosen different approaches? Well, I think, to go back a little bit, I mean, I think the, the focus on, on al-Qaeda specifically in the Clinton administration really crystallized in, in 1998 after the attacks on our embassies in, in Africa. 
before that, and I think this is a point that people don't understand now, that before 98, though we knew about the existence of bin Laden, we knew that he was a financier of terrorist activities, we actually weren't, didn't put the pieces together that in fact he had his fingers on many of these other things. So um, up until that point, there was an unclear picture. He had a lot of activity going on and people were definitely tracking him, but he wasn't kind of the central figure that he became after the attacks on our embassies when it became very, very clear that he was, he was um, driving a lot of this activity. So um, from that point forward, I would, I would characterize what we were going through at the White House as a very, very intensive exercise to reorganize ourselves um, to deal with this threat. Um, it was, we did not necessarily have what happened as a result of 9-11, which is everybody on, in the world paying attention to this in the, and having the intensity and the momentum behind it to make some of the changes that people are now contemplating. But there was a lot of energy and attention focused on this, and, and a lot of it was reorganizing the way we the way we track what's going on, the where information goes, and trying to fill in what we thought were holes in that process. So um, we were, I think, up until from 98 until the millennial attacks, or the, the thwarted millennial attacks uh, in, in December, uh, there was a lead up of activity to that point, and the, the flurry of activity that was going on in that period right before, before New Year's Eve was just incredible. Um, where I, I can't describe what it's, what it's like to be a policy official and feel that you know that something is going to happen. You have no idea where it's going to happen, what it's going to be. There's information coming in. You, don't, you can't quite assess that. Um, and, then, and then to luckily uh, be, able to, be able to stop it. So I think all of those things told us exactly what Brian was saying, which is that we knew that there, were more, there was more to come, uh, never quite sure where it was going to come from, um, always changing in its nature and its focus. And so by the end of the administration, um, you know, principal level meetings were happening sometimes three, four, five times a week on this very subject. Um, so there was definitely a, a critical focus on this, on this issue. Um, and interestingly, when during the transition, obviously Condi would come in and other people would come in and we would talk to them. And uh, one of the central things that we were interested in conveying to them is this is going to take up the majority of your time. You may not believe that, like, you, you know, you may think that there are other priorities, but this issue will command most of your time and attention, in part because it needed to have executive level attention uh, and organization and oversight. Um, so going forward after, after uh, the Bush administration took office, I think initially, as with all new administrations, they're just trying to figure out where things are, where, how, to, how to orient themselves. Because of the delay in them getting an office, they actually didn't have necessarily everybody in place right away. Um, but I think that in terms of their approach, it didn't change very much. And the reason I say that is after 9-11, you see a lot of the same work that, that we, the framework that we established that they've, they've used that as a way to launch into the next phase. So the, the bioterrorism um, projects that we were working on late in the administration, they, they took that and expanded all of that. The organization that we put in place, which essentially was under the PDDs that created the, the um, coordination mechanism within the White House, is essentially what the Office of Homeland Defense is. So I don't really see that there's that much of a difference uh, in the way they're approaching it from a, from a policy and structural perspective. The only place I think it, it would have been very different is that uh, the approach of a, a Clinton slash Gore administration going in would have been much more multilateral oriented. We had a very different vision of America's role in the world. Um, we would have continued with the peace process quite actively is my guess. Uh, we would have been maximally engaged. And so that initial period where they came in, where it was unclear where, where, what direction they were headed in, uh, I think a Gore-Clinton administration would have just been continuing down that same path. You brought up the peace process. Uh, there are a couple of issues, Iraq and the peace process, which people who follow them know have been sort of spiraling downwards independently. They were heading for trouble well before 911, right. but also are not entirely independent in the sense that they 
have fed into some of the uh, passions that Brian was talking about uh, in terms of uh, uh, well, some of the feelings of anti-Americanism and or discontent in large sections of the Muslim world. Uh, what is the connection, uh, if any, of Arab-Israeli issues to 911 and after? I, this is a complicated issue, but I think um, in generally, um, I'd say the link is very tenuous to nine, and particularly to 9-11 specifically. If you look at the timeline of things that were going on with the peace process, and the timeline of likely what was going on along the way with what bin Laden and al-Qaeda were up to, the two just don't match up um, as, as things, in fact, there was momentum in the peace process at the same time that bin Laden was planning, would have started plans for 9-11. Um, so the, so the, the momentum for peace and his activities are, are very um, discordant. So I don't see that there's much of a direct link between the exact events of 9-11 and, and the failure of the peace process, or the peace process at all. Um, that's just 9-11. But even more broadly, I think there's a, there's a big uh, assumption that discontent uh, and, and uh, concern for the plight of the Palestinians has somehow fed directly into al-Qaeda and fed the objectives of al-Qaeda and bin Laden. And I think it's important to, to keep clear about what bin Laden's and al-Qaeda's objective is. Um, it is essentially to dismantle regimes, like, like in Saudi Arabia, and create a religiously based Islamic empire, something across, the, across from Pakistan, across to North Africa. It is essentially, they have an, essentially the, this issue of Islam and how, whether or not you can have a modern nation state and whether or not Islam is compatible with that, that's kind of at the core of, of this dispute. Now the Israeli, this Israeli-Palestinian conflict is, is different in its nature. It's essentially a nationalist, you have Palestinians who have nationalist aspirations. Um, so the, the goals are very, very different. On the one hand, um, bin Laden and al-Qaeda want to tear down, essentially, nation states. The Palestinians actually want to build a nation state. Um, and so I think the, the objectives are very different. But at the highest level at this point, um, the frustrations of people generally, um, you haven't gotten down to that level of, of, of disconnect in terms of the agenda. Um, and the, the, the peace process itself, and we argue this in our, in our article, though it's not directly related to 9-11, or we would argue that, that bin Laden's interest in, in the plight of the Palestinians is anything more than rhetorical, that in fact solving this problem um, and the threat of terrorism and bin Laden and al-Qaeda has very much to do with the, with the peace process. And it's got to be a central piece of what we focus on going forward. Um, and for, for various reasons, not only because it obviously gets rid of this central element that is, is feeding anti-Americanism, but also it answers the question of whether or not this region can accept pluralism by having an Israeli state in the region. It also answers kind of the final question about whether or not the nation state, modern nation state framework will be accepted across the region. So um, I actually think it's one of the critical pieces uh, that we they, we really have to focus on, and unfortunately, at this point, the the picture is not so conducive to to a good outcome. Joe, um, if what Mona's saying is correct about some of the motivations of Bin Laden, is it fair to say that he sees himself in a clash of civilizations? And if he does, uh, does that mean we have to be? I think Bin Laden does see himself in a clash of civilizations. I think Moto is exactly right. Uh, you have to interpret his basic motivation as uh, going back into Islamic history. It's a very nice article in your book by uh, Karen Armstrong that explains that. And um, it really, that what triggered him off seems to be more the fact that American troops were remaining in the land of the two holy mosques. And the Palestinian-Israeli issue didn't come along till later in his litany. Um, and that, of course, was left over from the threat from Saddam Hussein. Um, and I think his motivation has been to try to polarize uh, 
the West versus Islam uh, along the lines that Sam Huntington talked about in the book, The Clash of Civilizations. But I think, the, I think it's a mistake for us to fall into that thinking. Not only are there more conflicts within Islam than between Islam and the West, uh, but in addition, you can really see what's happening as a civil war inside Islam. It's a clash within a civilization. And if we fell into his framing of it, it could become a clash of civilizations. And I think that's the place where President Bush deserves a, a good deal of credit. And Clinton, President Clinton before him did the same thing. Um, which is to stress the fact that this is not against Islam. I remember when I was with Clinton when he addressed the Jordanian par uh, parliament and the Israeli Knesset in the mid-90s. And he made a point of, of arguing that we're not against Islam, we're against terrorism, which is the killing of innocent people for political purposes. And I thought the way Bush responded quickly after 9-11 uh, by stressing that this was not against Islam was, was one of his uh, uh, finer ways of, of framing this. Uh, so I think, that, I think if you think of it as a civil war inside one civilization in which the radical Islamists are trying to polarize the situation so that they can convince more moderate Muslims that, uh, that this is a clash of civilization and that thus far they seem to have failed on that then I think that's a better way of framing this than to see it as a clash of civilizations or to put it in a simple version. There's more difference between Bin Laden and a moderate Muslim than between a moderate Muslim and most Americans. Everyone's being very nice and complimentary. Uh, your piece burns with a kind of Cassandra quality of, <laughs> uh, we were saying this, why didn't you schmucks listen? Uh, what? <laughs> How much of an intelligence failure was there? How much of a governmental failure was there? You were the head of the NIC, the National Intelligence Council. Uh, should we have seen this coming? Uh, should George Tenet be forced to resign in disgrace? Should uh, lots of people be you know, handed, sacked and handed their walking papers? Well, it, if you define an intelligence failure as failing to collect information and use it to protect the American people, then by definition, what happened on 9-11 was an intelligence failure. If you define it more narrowly, as John Deutsch does in a recent article in Foreign Policy, as failure to make use adequately of information that's already inside the system, then it may or may not be an intelligence failure. And the, the uh, joint hearings held between the Senate and House Intelligence Committees at the end of the month may try to tease that out. We have to hope that it doesn't become a, a, uh, a partisan issue and that it, doesn't that it becomes something which is serious about the organization of the intelligence community rather than a, uh, um, something which, which just sort of blames the, the intelligence community. Uh, for one thing, we don't want to divert them. Uh, they've got important work still to do. But, I, but going back to the first part of your question, which is should we have seen it coming? Um, a lot of people saw it coming. I mean, it, it, I mean in 19, I think I start my article for you with this. In 19, early 94, um, the National Intelligence Council had commissioned a very uh, tightly held study. It started out as a study of what had happened if terrorists got hold of nuclear weapons. As we got further into it, we realized that the biological threat was probably more imminent in the sense that it was a little bit easier for them to get. But we did a study which looked at both the prospects of biological and nuclear terrorism. At that time, we held it to, I think, 13 copies, which were very tightly distributed. And one of the reasons for that is we didn't want to provide ideas. In other words, the, you, know, you didn't want to create something where you could have a copycat or stimulating effect. And so, uh, this was very tightly held at the beginning. Then in uh, 95, we had uh, two things that happened. One was the Amshin Rikyo attack in the Tokyo subway system and the discovery that they had also been working on biological and nuclear uh, materials. And we also had our own purely homegrown Tim McVeigh, which is the worst terrorist incident in the United States before this. So it's very important not to think of terrorism simply as Islamic or growing out of this. I mean, there, there is a real problem with Al-Qaeda and that source of terrorism. But let me, let me raise this in, in, in a way which may, I hope, provoke Brian a little bit, because um, I've always admired his, his work on this. But when he says it wasn't, um, 
technology. I wonder if that's right. I mean, obviously, it wasn't just technology. When we did this study in 94, um, we said there are two new things which should put this on the top of the government's agenda. One is a new type of terrorist, and the other is new access to weapons that can do enormous catastrophic damage. And if you think of it that way, this is a theme that I try to develop in, in my Paradox of American Power book, which is that there's a diffusion of technology which is putting in the hands of deviant groups and individuals in any culture, including our own, capacities that used to be reserved just to governments. Governments, if you wanted to kill a million people in the past, you pretty much had to be a Stalin or a Mao or have a, have a big government apparatus to do it. If you want to kill a million people in 2010, uh, you can probably do it as a small group. And if you look at the progress of what progress, uh, whatever that word means, if you look at the progression of terrorism, which has been with us for centuries, it usually killed people in ones and twos. Um, you know, then you get the 70s, the Red Brigades and so forth, uh, what is it, the airport attacks maybe killing in the tens. Uh, in the 1980s, with the Air India attack of 350 or so killed, you're in the hundreds. Uh, by 2001, you're in the thousands. And we ought to ask ourselves, by 2010, do you think we will have seen a terrorist attack which goes up yet another order of magnitude and kills hundreds of thousands or millions? I think the answer to that is likely to be yes. Um, so was this an intelligence failure? Um, it was, a, it was a failure of, of intelligence with a small I. It was a failure of our society as a whole to deal with this. I think you could have seen this coming. Indeed, lots of reports, including ones that Brian worked on, did see it coming. And I think the, the question is, why did we lull ourselves so? I mean, and I think it's, it, you know, you can say, I, I think when we have these intelligence hearings, there are probably efforts to make it a partisan thing. It wasn't partisan. The Bush administration didn't suddenly get religion on January 21st of 2001. They're, they were not all that different. Um, and if we look at what happened in the 1990s when the Cold War ends, we cut back on our international uh, news two-thirds. We just stopped paying attention. Americans still say they're interested in international things, but we weren't. We were indifferent to the rest of the world. And there was a, we were lulled into a false complacency in the 90s. We started the decade with a Gulf War, which had very few casualties, ended it with a bombing of Serbia, which had no casualties at all, and we thought we were invincible and invulnerable. That's a huge failure of intelligence on a much broader scale than the intelligence community. So whatever they find out when the House and Senate committee have their joint hearings about what was in the system and how was it used and coordinated, and there certainly are problems there, that broader intelligence failure is something that we all ought to be thinking about. Brian, what do you think about the intelligence failure question? Well, I mean, uh, clearly, intelligence failed in that uh, we were not able to either obtain the information or to exploit the information we had in order to, to predict and uh, prevent uh, the September 11th attack. The question to me really is, was that failure on, and in that particular uh, moment, uh, was that a, a reflection of how difficult it is simply to obtain information about terrorist organizations uh, which are small conspiracies, which, which are uh, uh, global in their connections, which, uh, uh, or is it, a, is it some systemic failure in the way we, in this country, organizationally go about the collection and analysis of intelligence? Is that your answer? Um, I, I would say my, my answer, I would tend to, you know, there's some of both. My answer is that, that there are just extraordinarily uh, uh, inherently difficult uh, uh, things in terms of intelligence. I mean, if we look at, for example, to take this out of the U.S. realm for, for a moment, where I agree with, with Professor Nye, this can become easily turned into kind of a partisan debate, and, and that, has, that has no utility. But, you know, if we look at the history, for example, of the United Kingdom in dealing with the IRA for a period of three decades, uh, this was somebody that was closer to them geographically, culturally, 
they had the language capabilities, and to be sure, there was a degree of penetration. But nonetheless, large-scale terrorist events took place despite um, the determination of the government. And, and it wasn't that the British government was asleep in the sense that some people might say that GR society was sleeping about some of these terrorist threats. Uh, they were onto this, and they were surprised. If one looks at the history of, of, of Israel and the efforts of, of the Mossad and the Shin Beth to, to, to deal with terrorism, to be sure they thwart a lot of terrorist attacks, but they miss a certain number of, of, of large-scale events as well. And when we look at our intelligence, it's not simply our intelligence. And, uh, in terms of terrorism, there is, not as good as it should be, but there is a fair amount of, of, of exchange of intelligence uh, uh, among the nations of the world, at least a, a number of those on intelligence. So we just didn't miss this. A lot of people miss this one. And that says it's hard to do. Um, now, are there inherent difficulties in the way we do it? Uh, there have been arguments made that uh, uh, regarding resources, the issue that we don't have enough resources devoted to this, that we need more resources. There have been arguments made that some of the restrictions on recruiting of, of sources of intelligence have Im 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 impeded our, our collection process. That's a debate. There are arguments that, uh, most recently in, 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 in a new book on, on, on intelligence, that we, in fact, were resistant to looking too hard at some of these things because we didn't want to know. The, the truth was, was, was troublesome. There are, I think, some, some, some arguments made about the division within the government of intelligence responsibilities and the ability to share that information. There certainly is a lot more sharing than there was uh, uh, 10 years ago. Is it sufficient? There's an even broader question that today's threats may not entirely match the organizations that we have created over the past half century to collect and gather intelligence. Do these separations between FBI and CIA, do they make sense? Um, I, I don't have an opinion on that, but it certainly is a fair question to ask. Now, despite all of these difficulties, one looks at the, at the record, and here record has to be put in quotes. We still, I, I would guess on the basis of my own knowledge, that we're probably identifying and thwarting somewhere in the territory of 80 to 90 percent of major terrorist attacks directed against Americans uh, here or abroad. Now, don't make too much of that number. I mean, it's hard to count things that don't occur. And we don't know how many terrorist attacks were aborted or people changed their mind because we in evacuated an embassy or increased security or made a public announcement that we're on alert or something like that. So, but even where we, we think there was a fairly mature plot, either by, uh, through intelligence, or in some cases, just uh, the, the luck of having a, a, a very attentive customs agent or somebody does the right thing, we have blocked a fair number. But if we move into the realm of terrorism that Professor Nye is talking about, 90% uh, isn't going to be good enough if that remaining 10% are at the scale that is potentially on the horizon. Great. So one tells us that by 2010 we're going to be killing millions, and another tells us we can't really stop them. So I would suggest that first-year graduate students might want to reconsider how they spend their last decade. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with that, let's, uh, what's, the, what's the time to degree now? Eight years, nine years? Well, I mean, I think that how you want members, to I think members ought, of the audience ought to ask themselves the question. If you make your own subjective probabilities, do you think you will see this decade-long progression of an order of magnitude change that I've described occurring? If so, do you think you will see a death of 100,000 people in American City by the year 2010? I wish I could say the answer is no. The only optimistic thing I have to say is I followed exactly that logic with the NASDAQ, and it didn't quite work. <laughs> so, uh, 
Uh, maybe if the terrorists go the, go the route of the bubble, then we're all okay. Uh, with that, let's uh, turn to your questions. There are four microphones, two on the floor here and two up on the level up there. Uh, please uh, go to the microphones and uh, state your name and uh, ask a brief, concise question, and we'll try to get as many uh, in as possible. Yes, over here. My name is Alexander Rossolimo. I'm president of Strategy Associates International. Uh, the U.S. spends roughly $30 billion a year on intelligence. There is an old rule of thumb in corporate strategy that it costs the government $2 to accomplish what the private sector can do for $1, and private enterprise is usually faster. So my question is, what are the opportunities for privatizing intelligence? After all, business, industry, banking, finance, utilities have become a primary target of terrorists. What else can they do? What, how else can private enterprise help? Okay, let's take a couple of questions there and over here. Well, I guess that could be added to mine. I'm Ellen Hume, a journalist and teacher, and I'm very interested in how we address this dire situation. Maybe three or four very concrete proposals on what needs to be done. And I'm not just talking about tracking emails. But, but what do we need to do that won't fall into the pattern of something that we think they, that it's exactly what they want us to do? How do we find that kind of uh, tactic? Okay, who wants to take that? Uh, privatizing intelligence and... Well, let, uh, having served in the, in, in the, in the private sector in, in, a, in a private investigative firm, let, let me talk about privatization of intelligence. It, it is true that, that uh, in, in some particular areas, the, uh, the private sector was, was more adept at, uh, for example, if we go back to the beginning of, of the 1990s, in tracking down assets, uh, the private investigative world knew how to do this better probably than the U.S. government knew how to, to do it. That's an assertion, but, but they, they operated in that area more, more, more comfortably. I think, in fact, intelligence is being privatized not in a way that it's necessarily uh, going to accrue to a profit, uh, 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 make a profit for, for anyone, but in a different sense. Uh, take the issue of uh, finances and the efforts to control the financial flow going to the terrorists. Um, money moves through banks. We mandate that there is going to be, at, at the government level, that there is going to be more monitoring and control of where this money goes, and that the penalty for not exercising that control, whether we're talking about money laundering in general or flows of funds to terrorist organizations in particular, that there's going to be penalties for that. That is a way of shifting, to a certain extent, an intelligence function from the public sector into the private sector. We regularly do that in the realm of security. We have shifted. We have two million people in this country that are employed in the private security industry. Now, that's roughly equivalent to the size of the armed forces at the height of the Cold War. And, and we can, in fact, take that a step further and we can say that, look, we are going to provide better training for the people in the private security area. So when we have a national alert and we want people to look for something, we can in fact train them what to look for. What are anomalies? What are things that we want them to do? We can go further and mandate that those who are uh, 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 working in protecting critical infrastructure, that they will meet certain performance standards without federalizing, as we've done in aviation. The, the federalization of the aviation security forces is a bit of a reverse trend, in, in a sense of taking something back in government. But in these other areas, I, uh, when it comes to, say, uh, control of precursor chemicals, when it comes to some of the things in the biological area, uh, some of the things in the nuclear area, I think, in fact, we're going to see uh, uh, increasing efforts to involve the private sector, because we have to on that. Now, we can, we can state that in, in uh, hopefully uh, benign terms, in terms of private sector, public sector partnerships. But apart from partnerships, in some cases, some of it is simply going to be mandated 
by government, and I think that is one major, by the way, change in the environment after September 11th. And that is we are moving in a direction in which uh, the flow of trade, finance, and people was something that was being uh, uh, allowed to move uh, uh, more and more freely. And government, in a sense, in certain functions, in certain areas, was being marginalized. And now we are seeing government is really important. And we're now talking about not only protection of, 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 of the homeland, we're talking about frontiers, borders. We're reintroducing some government controls. Yeah, there's a very interesting chapter in the book uh, on precisely this question uh, by a guy named Steve Flynn, who's commander in the Coast Guard. And it really it basically argues that the only way to deal with some of these issues uh, is to essentially create a new regime for policing the flows of globalization in terms of goods and, and people. And it's, it, it, the scope of the challenge that it lays out is, is quite, it's quite interesting. Joe. Uh, yeah, I, just uh, if I can uh, quickly, what, I think what Brian Jenkins said is right. The intelligence is already privatized. There's, there are vast resources that firms put into intelligence, uh, and they have to. Uh, but the idea that means you don't need government intelligence is a non sequitur. They do different things. The problem is how do you stitch the two together? Because if you're, for example, worried about uh, an attack on a, on, uh, a network which controls electricity or that controls financial flows, a lot of that is private. The government may get the information. How does it translate it effectively to the private sector? And how do you get the private sector to take higher measures of protection than they have? I think the biggest point, and this goes to Ellen's question, the biggest point is we have to rethink our organization. We are a society that was created by founding fathers who wanted to make sure that we had weak government so that King George couldn't rule over us and nobody else could either. And we are going to have to find ways to cross the boundaries of our society between public and private and between state and local and federal if we're going to take the measures we need. Tom Ridge, the director of the Office of Homeland Security, constantly makes the point that he can't do this by a czar in Washington. Everybody has to do it. And to give you an example of this, a few years ago, we had the Marsh Commission, which looked at critical infrastructure. And one of the problems is the government found it very difficult to get the information from the private sector, because people in the private sector didn't want to give away information they saw as proprietary or which might get government into their business. Uh, unless we overcome that kind of seam in our society, and unless we overcome the seams between federal bureaucracies and between state and local and federal, we're going to have deep difficulties on this. So I think the answer to Ellen's question is we really have to think of reorganization. And it's partly in intelligence. It's partly in preparation so that we raise the barrier so that it's that uh, it's harder for these people to exploit the vulnerabilities, and we have not done that very well. I mean, that's is the per that's is what my chapter of the book says. But there are a lot of things we can do which don't touch civil liberties in the least to organize ourselves to be more effective, both in raising the barrier and also getting a better flow of information in intelligence. I mean, what do we have now? We have the the CIA and the FBI giving alerts which are totally useless, saying there's going to be a terrorist attack somewhere in the next few months. Well, you know what? You can't stand on tiptoes forever. And when you tell these local police chiefs that there's going to be an attack and it's that vague and diffuse, it is worse than useless. Uh, and what you, what, maybe one of the things that Governor Ridge is now trying to do is to get a sophisticated alert system so that you can tell people, well, it's a this kind of thing and look out for that type of plants or that, I mean, to get something more useful and get more information down to state and local police forces so they can alert citizens and others, look out for this, whether it's bridges in some cases or nuclear plants in others or, or whatever. But we just have not developed the procedures we need in this country to protect ourselves from this type of attack. Mona, do you have a pet policy yeah, I was description? I going to say that one of the, and one of the add-on problems, which is of concern, is that right now there's a lot of activity and activity doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily going to lead us to be safer in the end. So there's a strong desire, obviously, after this to very quickly fix things. So you have local communities going out and deciding that they're going to, you know, go out and buy gas masks and suits and all this. And, and it's a real challenge, I think, for the Office of Homeland Security to not only 
quickly understand what the vulnerabilities are, but figure out a framework so that everybody's kind of working in step when in fact they've never even spoken to each other, much less tried to cooperate on something of this, of this magnitude. So my, my biggest concern is that the, that the bureaucracy will try to fix this quickly and, and just run out and do things um, because everybody wants to show that they have results and, and our system is designed that way without standing back for a second and taking stock and saying, okay, so how are we really gonna do this in an effective way? And um, you know, a good way of figuring that out is the extent to which the Hill starts to get involved in actual procurement decisions and a bunch of other things, so, which, which could be really dangerous to, that, to the likelihood of that result, so. It's worth pointing out that um, for hometown boy reasons, uh, one of the best thinkers on the whole question of homeland defense who is now working uh, with uh, Ridge in the office there is a former Kennedy School professor, uh, Richard Falkenrath, right? Are you very proud of him and doing a good job? We are. <laughs> He's very good. There are times when people go into the system who actually know what they're talking about, and I think that's one of the, that's one of the situations. Okay, two more questions here and there. <laughs> I'm Bob Zelnick from Boston University. Uh, the administration seems to be directing its energies now toward Iraq as the next big terrorism uh, event, despite the fact that Iraq's involvement in the events of 9-11 was nowhere near as clear as Al-Qaeda's. Um, this has led, and of course over the years, Iraq's calling card has been more development of weapons of mass destruction uh, than support of terrorism groups, although it's done both. But it's led some voices, particularly abroad, to suggest that the administration is off on some sort of personal frolic uh, and that uh, approaching Iraq as it is, is is not fully justified. I take it from your comments, particularly you, Joe, that the uh, war on terrorism cannot possibly be won if the war against weapons of mass destruction is lost, and this would suggest the wisdom of attacking a, a nation like Iraq. Well, I... I oh, let's get oh, to Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, <coughs> a different question. Oh, bundle them. Okay, my uh, question is that in view of the circumstances that the United States has found itself, I am puzzled that I almost never hear any discussion as to why there are individuals who have such strong rage against the United States that they would be willing to undertake a mission which involves suicide. And I'd like to know if it is not true that the perception of a bias by the United States, whether it's real or not, that the United States does not treat and does not respect Arab or Muslim people like they do others, and that the way in which the United States government has provided massive arms and financial support to the state of Israel and the Israeli policy has not been favorable to the Palestinians in the taking over of land and the perception in the Muslim world, according to my reading, is quite clear that <clears throat> the United States is not a uh, friend of those people. And I want to know if it is not worthwhile considering what motivates these people to such incredible anger and whether or not there's going to be any prospect of relief of this terrorist act unless we consider very carefully what it is we're doing. Iraq counterproliferation and anti-Americanism. Joe, well, let, me, Iraq. let me just let me do Bob's question about Iraq and then maybe Mona's who's written on this could, could do the, uh, the, one of the other ones. But, but, um, I thought President Bush was correct to say that if you are a state which is violating your multilateral treaty obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty and developing weapons of mass destruction, and you also are harboring terrorists, you are posing a peril to us and to others, and we will not allow that peril to develop in a way where we find out about it too late. So I actually, unlike a lot of people who say you should leave Iraq alone, I don't agree with that. At the same time, I would never have lumped Iraq, Iran, and North Korea together. 
I mean, that was an excess of rhetoric by some clever speechwriter. I hope that's the explanation. Because we had a program in North Korea which actually had reduced the threat and had done serious things. And Iran is very different from Iraq. And the wrapping this all together as an axis of evil was, to my mind, a severe policy failure. But the underlying insight that he was getting at, which is that countries, which all three of those do, which have had a history of supporting terrorism and an effort to violate their NPT obligations to develop weapons of mass destruction, are not going to be allowed to come full circle on that. I happen to agree with that for the reasons I said earlier. If we have destruction, we, we have, as a society, been quite robust in responding to 9-11. To, to I mean, you know, basically, at that level of terrorism, we could probably tolerate a number of terrorist events without losing what we hold dear, our democracy and civil liberties. A number of 100,000 or million casualty terrorist events I think are going to transform what we think of as urban life and what we think of as the civil liberties. And I think you have to take that very seriously. So I would say I would not allow Iraq to redevelop its weapons of mass destruction. I would do it, however, by not looking for phony evidence, uh, but by saying Iraq has signed a multilateral treaty. It has violated a multilateral treaty. UN inspectors are supposed to be in there. It has defied the UN resolution. I would build the case on the peril that Iraq is, fate is prosing along those lines and try to develop a coalition of states to say that this violation of the multilateral NPT is unacceptable. So I would not pin it on the, on the you know, did somebody meet with somebody else in Prague a couple of years ago. I would pin it on the source of the new threat. But I would also be very careful to make sure I did bring other countries along with it. Because if you think the clear and present danger that we face in the short run, not in five years, but in the short run of five months, comes from Al Qaeda, which still has cells in 50 countries, if we get into a spitting match with our allies and friends over Iraq so that we get less cooperation in wrapping up Al Qaeda, we will have shot ourselves in our foot. And so I would say, yes, develop a consensus for dealing with Iraq before it gets weapons of mass destruction. But don't take your eye off the ball, which is, first of all, to wrap up these Al Qaeda cells. And 80% of that is not military work, it's civilian work. On Iraq, I would say that the, uh, I just put in a little, little plug in here, the, most, the single most interesting thing I've seen on the Iraq uh, question is a piece that's going to come out in the next couple of weeks in foreign affairs by another Cambridge-affiliated guy, other side of Cambridge, MIT, but uh, Kenny Pollack, who was a colleague of Mona's uh, on the NSC staff, um, who, who really ends up making the case for invasion, which is surprising because he was one of the yeah. strongest advocates of... <laughs> Got to talk to him about that. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, well, it's a very interesting piece. The next issue of foreign affairs, has, that'll be a good piece. Actually, but I, had, I have actually have a follow-up question for you. Let's say you can't get the coalition going, right? Just nobody's going to do it. Um, even, and we don't have, you know, the Brits are willing to walk away from us or are getting shaky. Um, would you, but, and you were really concerned, let's say there were actual signs of development of weapons of mass destruction in a way that is greater than it is right now. Would you go, would you advocate going in alone, potentially? Possibly. I mean, I, I, this, this book that I so mentioned I mean, we, earlier <laughs> um, is subtitled, Why the World's Only Superpower Can't Go It Alone. But in the final chapter, I argue that multilateralism and unilateralism is a spectrum. Nobody is a pure multilateralist or a pure unilateralist. We should start from a presumption of multilateralism. But one of the, one of the, and I list several exceptions when you might turn to unilateralism. One is survival. And if, if we really couldn't persuade others to go along and we thought it was affecting survival, my answer to that is yes. But we'd have to be very inept in our diplomacy to do it that way. If we rushed into this by just saying, this is it, and everybody fall in place, or tried to pin it on somebody that met in Prague two years ago, then we would probably produce that result of not having any allies. I think we can, by working on this gradually, convince enough people that they too are in peril from what Saddam is doing. And then with a little extra effort from our side, I think we can get enough to go along with us so we don't have to be in that position. Right, Who wants to tackle the why do they hate us question and the Palestinian angle? Anybody want to? 
Let, let me make a, not so much on the Palestinian angle, but let me talk about the suicide issue. Because the, the, there was, I, I think, a, a again, a, a, a dramatic development that was demonstrated in September 11th, that the suicide attackers, and put aside for a moment, the, the likelihood that perhaps not all members of the 19 who participated in the attacks knew that they were going to commit suicide. We, knew, we know with certainty that six or seven did, uh, possibly 12 or 13. Some others might not have known, although if they had any knowledge of previous al-Qaeda operations, one wonders exactly what was in their mind as to how this thing was going to end up. But, but uh, put that aside for a moment. That suicide uh, operation differed from the kinds of individual suicide operations we see in, for example, Israel, where a young men, uh, in one case a young woman, uh, often, uh, uh, from, uh, often with limited educations, in some cases, uh, 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 limited economic prospects, and in some cases even psychologically damaged, are recruited and launched to carry out an attack fairly close to where they are recruited. And that, that's, that's a, a close proximity. In September 11th, we had a group of people, which is far more interesting in terms of carrying out a suicide attack than an individual, uh, much uh, higher on the socioeconomic scale, higher on the educational scale, and who, absent handlers to reinforce uh, their resolve, lived normal lives for months, probably even years, while this operation was being planned. Now, that's, that's something quite different. In looking at that, I, I don't think that can be explained simply by resentment or rage, uh, although certainly feelings of, of, of humiliation and, and, and defeat and, and anger probably play into it. Um, I don't think that you can assign one to carry out that kind of an omission. You can't even intellectually persuade someone to do that. Uh, there really has to be something deep down in that person that you can then uh, awaken and exploit so that you are, in effect, if you are the manager of this operation, you are giving the person an opportunity to fulfill their long-term or life goal, and they will remain committed to it because it's very much their own personal thing. Now, the, 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 probably the major contribution that Osama bin Laden has, has made, if one can talk about contributions, but in this realm of terrorism, is that he has offered to a lot of young people who, um, who are feeling anger for all sorts of reasons, economic, political uh, anger, who are feeling threatened for all sorts of reasons, he has offered an interpretation of a specific, cat a specific kind of uh, Islam, and I agree with, with, uh, with, with Joe here. And that is, first of all, by offering or, or promising to recreate the seventh century caliphate, it transcends national borders and it breaks down the boundaries between terrorist groups in various parts of the world so that you can get a larger reservoir, a larger human reservoir, to recruit from. And that's an important contribution. Um, second, by exploiting various constituencies and redefining the obstacle to the achievement of objectives across the board, whether it's for Algerians, Egyptians, Saudis, or whoever, that the United States is the principal target, that is a contribution. By then saying the acceptance of a, 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 an aggressive interpretation of Islam and a benchmark of commitment being suicide, commitment to the point of willingness to give your life, that in turn 
is 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 something that that um, as I say is is a contribution and can begin to have some appeal. Now, out of all of the thousands of angry young men uh, uh, throughout the Arab world, throughout Islam, um, I don't know how many of them are willing and capable of carrying out an operation on the scale of September 11th and remaining committed and commit a suicide. But if you have a large enough pool, you can, you can find a handful of those individuals. And, and that's really why, and this to, to finish up and, and simply underlining a, a, a point made by, by Joe, and that is why for me, I'm, I'm, I'm the Senator Cato, really, of, of, uh, in, in terms of looking at Al-Qaeda. I mean, I, I end every speech with, and furthermore, Al-Qaeda must be destroyed. Uh, this thing has to be broken apart. This, this has to be broken up. Uh, it remains the immediate threat. I accept that Iraq, Iran, and North Korea are also threats of a different type. They were threats long before September 11th. I agree that it's inappropriate to conflate them into a single threat. But to me, our immediate focus has to be on al-Qaeda. We have done the first part in Afghanistan unilaterally because we're good at delivering ordnance, and Afghanistan is a pretty damn good place to deliver it. We cannot do the next phase unilaterally. Tearing up these cells in 50 countries is going to require a great deal of international cooperation. We risk, we imperil that cooperation if we begin to load on it <coughs> other agendas for which they may not be ready. Now, we can get there. But until we get there, uh, to me, our immediate focus has to be Al-Qaeda. That requires international cooperation. Well, one last point on this. You're an intelligent, well-meaning woman. You were right at the heart of you know, American foreign policy. Why does everybody hate you? Why does everybody hate us? Right, exactly. Well, I was just going to say, I think, what you were saying earlier about the little intelligence and people lulled into this sense that everything is wonderful in the world, um, at least people in the United States feeling that way. Um, and 9-11 has really, I think, caught people by surprise. I was struck by the number of people who are very well read, very well traveled, who were shocked that people outside of the United States hate us as much as, as some people do. And I think that there is a, um, the way people perceive of us and the, the way we exercise our power um, is, is, is difficult, I think, for, for outside countries. And I think what happens is, is that people, people outside the United States feel that they can't get our attention. Um, we have a tendency to be very self-involved. We have a tendency to exercise our power in a way um, that is not recognizing the, the depth of the reverberation of, of exercising that power. And I think it becomes, it can become a really, um, a really challenging thing for us to step back and to say, okay, we, our, our words matter, what we say matters, people listen to, to, to what it is that we want, um, people react to our power, and we have to lead not only with our power, but also with our authority. People expect that what we say is going to be consistent, that what we do is going to be backed up later. Um, and I think all of those things people are uncertain about, and in this post-Cold War era, um, you know, we're the only people on the block that people pay attention to. So there is, I think, um, we, we do have, I think, some soul searching to do as a country um, and some paying attention to do about, you know, this isn't just an Arab world problem. I mean, you go to Europe, people are railing against the United States left and right, and, you know, there are dangers in Latin America for the same and the same in Asia. So it's not unique to this particular uh, situation, uh, something that I think I think we collectively need to be aware of and do something about. Okay, over here. Charles Dunbar from Simmons College in Boston. Uh, I guess I will, I'm just more or less going along with the, the point that you began to make because I think you were tending to leave an impression that in some way uh, we could uh, divorce ourselves from a clash of civilizations that is going on in the Muslim world. Uh, we are very, very much involved in that clash of civilizations, and there are two 
important connections. The first is our support of um, regimes that are less than popular in many of the uh, key countries in the region. And the second, of course, is the, is the struggle because between what we can now call, uh, as an American diplomat who lived for 21 years in the Middle East, it would have broken my teeth, as they say in Iran, to say Palestine. Now I can say that, thanks to what President Bush has said, and Israel. Uh, those connections mean that we are deeply involved in this political, in, in this struggle in the Middle East, and the struggle has to do with the catastrophic failures of the political economies of another uh, number of countries in the region. And there isn't a lot that we can do about that. That is going to have to sort itself out over time, and we are going to be extremely vulnerable to uh, terrorism. Uh, during that, that uh, period of time because there are going to be a lot of angry young men and now angry young women who are going to keep being willing to do what they do. But uh, I think a key point is that we need to find a way, we need, as we can, and it's very, very hard to put some distance between ourselves and regimes that we have to deal with. Look at Central Asia. We now are, is, are dealing close. Sorry? Is there a question? Yes, there is. And I don't, I'm not quite sure what it is yet, and I will just fulminate <laughs> for another 15 <laughs> seconds or so, if, you, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, Central Asia, we have uh, formed relationships with two very noxious regimes. And if we're concerned about political Islam in Central Asia, that's a problem. So I guess uh, the point is, in my view, uh, the central point is we have got to do more about trying to fix the Arab-Israeli dispute, and I think it, I guess I'm answering her question, how's that? Uh, that we need a campaign in this country uh, that begins to explain to the American people why we are engaging and why eventually we will have to impose some kind of a solution in, um, in the uh, dispute between the Palestinians and the is Israelis. And I guess I would like comments on that assertion, and thank you for listening to me. I call that a council question. At the Council on Foreign Relations, the members always ask questions, then the question really is a speech, which then is, and so what do you think of what I just said? <laughs> um, well, let's get these two questions also in here. Uh, Dave Houck, journalist. Uh, a lot was written after 9-11 um, about the, how the teeth had been taken out of intelligence uh, for various reasons since, really since Vietnam. Um, is that true? And if it is, were there any, specifically any tools that were not at the disposal of the intelligence world that would have thwarted 9-11 and um, what might be being done now to put those teeth back in. Okay, and one behind. Um, Andrew Brown, my question is what exactly is the evidence that there are moderate elements in the Muslim world gearing up for a civil war on the fundamentalists? Okay, and let's, uh, okay, let's take those two. Anybody, anybody want to tackle any of those? Um, well, I can talk a little bit about the Israeli I mean, I agree that we need to be engaged in the, in the, in the peace process or what are the remnants of the peace process um, on the merits um, just so that we can resol help resolve the situation. It's also a place where we have a natural leadership role and we need to be exercising and it's a way to show that we have, that we in fact do care about the region, that we are, this war is not against Islam and it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful way to demonstrate that. Um, and it's also central to our U.S. Our, our strategic interests. So we should be pursuing that. Now, how to do that is, total, is a whole other conversation, given the situation on the ground. But I think that's a separate question from what's going on in the rest of the Arab world within those regimes. And I think it goes back to what Joe was saying, which is that there is a central question about the nature of these modern nation states and how they deal with the, the fact that it's in, based on Islam and the, the disconnect between those two things. Um, and those are, those are conversations that have to happen in every single regime. Um, they are, at the same time, very insecure. Um, they are uncertain about how to deal with what are legitimate forms of expression and how to deal with pluralism in their own societies. But that's something that we, we will not have a central role in dealing with. It would be like if, if we had the British commenting on race relations in the United States and trying to help us with that. It is something fundamental to those countries. And I think our, our first goal should be do no harm, which we, we often, I don't think we realize that everything we do and say does impact what goes on in each of those countries. And we have a huge stake in making sure that they come out the right way at the end. So we just have to pay attention. So when you 
the, the rhetoric of axis of evil and other things like that, that, that is dangerous. It creates more difficulty, not less. So that would be my only take on that. Maybe I could uh, deal with the intelligence question. Um, it's become a new conventional wisdom that we sort of gave away all our intelligence capabilities, particularly human intelligence, uh, you know, spies. Uh, it's really, that's much too simple. Um, I, I do urge you to take a look at this article by John Deutsch in the recent issue of Foreign Policy. Uh, sorry, Gideon, but uh, uh, which, which says that the order that was put in in the mid-90s, which said that uh, human intelligence officers, director of operations officers, had to have approval when they were dealing with unsavory characters from headquarters. Didn't mean you stopped it. It meant that essentially there were some cases where, where some of these contacts were highly inappropriate. And by having to take them up to a high level and get them approved, uh, it screened out some of the ones where you were dealing with terrible human rights violators for no benefit at all. Uh, at, but at the same time, it authorized agents in the field who might wonder whether they might someday in the future be called before a congressional committee and uh, pilloried for this. They, they could say, listen, this was approved at higher levels. So some of the view that uh, you know, the Clinton administration gutted the humid part of CIA is simply not true. And I think Deutsch's article is quite good on explaining this. I also, from my experience, know that we have some superb human intelligence. I mean, the, you know, it's the, the idea that it's all gone away is simply not true. We don't have enough. And that means two things. One is you have to cooperate with other countries. Most likely people to know what's really happening in their neighborhood are the people who are there, which means that intelligence cooperation is extremely important. And if you are arrogant and alienating other people, you're going to get less in intelligence cooperation than if you are cooperating with them in a way which they feel they're being listened to. Uh, in addition, I think if you ask what is the bigger form of failure uh, that we experienced in the 90s and indeed the first eight months of the Bush administration, it's not so much the failure to invest or this, this false dichotomy that we were doing too much technical collection and not enough human collection. We need both and actually they reinforce each other. The problem is we don't know how to disseminate information once we get it. We don't know how to get it to the right place at the right time. The FBI has one counterterrorism center. The CIA has another counterterrorism center. Now, there are officials of the FBI in the CIA counterterrorism center and vice versa. But we still haven't got the seams stitched together in our intelligence community fabric. And that, I think, is a greater problem than the alleged curtailment of human, which occurred in the 90s. That doesn't mean I don't think we should be spending more and doing more on human intelligence. I think we should. But it's now become a, an easy conventional wisdom, which you read in, in one account after another, that uh, it's because Clinton got all fuzzy about human rights and cut back on the real spies that we got into this. That's just much too simple. Last question over here. I'm Jason Cadlett. I'm a fellow at the Kennedy School here. Which one? This gentleman's question. Oh, uh, evidence for moderate Muslims. Uh, well, I feel... I, Harami? <laughs> well, <laughs> Harami, exactly. I think the evidence that there are moderate, moderate Muslims out there is that you've not seen, I think, that the, that the um, exhortation from bin Laden for Muslims to rise up in the streets and that people expected chaos after 9-11 and are entering Afghanistan, that in fact you haven't really seen a whole lot in the Arab street. Um, and there has not been challenged you haven't seen challenges to the to the regimes as you would as you would think in places like Egypt or elsewhere i think that people were worried about immediately following 911 that it was and and immediately following our our the beginning of our military action there so i think the the vast i think we do have a, a big problem with with winning hearts and minds of intellectual and moderate arabs who who aren't Who've, who've just come to the conclusion that somehow their interests are not are not in line with with the United States or with the West more generally, but I think that that's not it's it's not as much of a problem as as people 
think it, it is. And I think we, those people are going to be the basis for, for fixing this, this problem in the future. Last question over here. I'm Jason Kapp. I'm a fellow at the Kennedy School here. One of the proposals for preventing commercial airliners from being used as uh, uh, ordnance has been to install facial recognition technology uh, in airports and to try to recognize terrorists before they board. And I recently heard the CEO of one of the companies providing the software saying that in addition to the false positive rates and other technical difficulties, a major problem is that uh, the intelligent authorities who have uh, presumably some databases of pictures of known terrorists are reluctant to provide them to airport security staff. Uh, does the panel think that this technology uh, is a plausible way of reducing uh, the number of, uh, of terrorist attacks on airlines? And let me piggyback one final question on that, which is uh, in his chapter in the book on the intelligence reform question, uh, Dick Betts points out that while it's easy to talk about governmental failures and it's also true about societal failures in terms of uh, lack of interest uh, and expertise. Uh, the academy should also uh, come in for some blame uh, in the turning away of relevant fields uh, from engagement with the real world, from deep involvement and knowledge of the real world, uh, and pointing out, for example, the decline in things like area studies. Uh, compared to the rise of more abstract uh, game theoretic approaches that may or may not provide insight. And I'd be curious, uh, in addition to the face recognition uh, question, if uh, here we have the, the head of the Kennedy School and a uh, professor in the government department, we have one of the world's leading terrorism experts who I know has been bemoaning the, uh, the quality and amount of serious terrorism studies for ages. Uh, what, if anything, needs to change not just in government practice and you know, public apathy, but in terms of how we as scholar practitioners think and train people to deal with these questions on the road? Let, let me, let me uh, deal first with the, with the facial rec recognition issue. Um, it is a technology. It's on the horizon. Uh, there are a number of, of issues that raises uh, I mean, the technology itself needs to be perfected, and, and I presume that will come with natural, natural development. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why, uh, if, in fact, um, the authorities had, had uh, photographs of, of known or suspected terrorists, why there would be any reluctant, reluctance to share those. In fact, in contrast, we certainly have seen in recent months and as recent as just a few days ago, uh, the broadcast of, 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 of pictures uh, to try to help the law enforcement authorities and, and the public uh, identify any of these individuals. So I don't think that is going to be the barrier. But with regard to aviation security, the problem we, we deal with there is, is that we have uh, technologies that are working technologies now that we simply have not deployed because there was not until September 11th uh, a sufficient appreciation of the threat. Uh, I served on a, on, on a commission in 1996 and 1997 that dealt with aviation safety and security. And we had recommended at that time the deployment, for example, of explosives detection technology. Um, we have 450 airports in this country. We need over uh, uh, 2,000 machines to provide adequate coverage. In the time between the recommendation of that commission and September 11th, there were about 100, 140 machines that were deployed, uh, far less than, than what we need. Uh, there are other technologies that we have uh, uh, available that we could deploy. We also know we have to improve the human performance of those involved in aviation uh, security. So when we look at aviation security, I think the important thing is that because of the, the ability to, to turn a, uh, a hijacked aircraft into a, into a guided missile, it does raise aviation security to the level of national security. And we sure as hell cannot protect all of the things on the ground adequately against airplanes, commercial airliners crashing into them. So we have to do a better job of protecting those airliners to begin with. Um, I don't think we have done a good enough job uh, over the years, as I say, not to, not to 
uh, not to uh, p uh, point to any particular sector for culpability on this, but in the name of, of cheap and convenient air travel, uh, the government has failed to uh, impose, the industry has failed to adopt, uh, the public has failed to demand adequate aviation security. Now we have learned a terrible, terrible lesson, and we have an opportunity to do so, and we are doing some things, but I, I think we have to do a, a great deal more in that area uh, that goes well beyond the, the, uh, the legislation uh, that was passed this last fall. This is going to be an, an, ongoing, an ongoing campaign. And to me, this should, ought to have the urgency of a, 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 wartime, a, a wartime mission. Uh, when I'm told that it will take several years to do this or several years to do that, I'm reminded that uh, some people have compared uh, September 11th with, with Pearl Harbor. Eleven months after Pearl Harbor, we landed a uh, uh, hundred thousand men, an army of a hundred thousand men off of uh, an armada of a hundred warships on the coast of Africa to go to war with what was then the mightiest military power uh, on the planet, uh, the German army, and, and we did so. Uh, so when, I, when I'm told that uh, we cannot do certain things to improve the quality of 30,000 airport screeners or to deploy explosive detection technology, uh, I'm, I'm not persuaded by, those, by those, particular, uh, those particular arguments. So facial recognition, yes, contribution, potentially down the road, not the key factor. A hell of a lot we have to do before we get there. Okay. Uh you want to take a little stab at my thing, or do you just want to? Uh, well, I, I will say one footnote on what Brian said before okay. I take yours, which is that's it. there are things we can do now uh, which don't invade civil liberties in which the technology exists. Uh, the idea of a fast track for airports, if you're willing to submit yourself to a half an hour security screening in advance and have a biometric identifier, then you should be able to go through a, 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 a you know a, a gate that uh, that lets you through quickly, and that doesn't discriminate between Arab Americans or any other Americans. Anybody who wants to, if you're a, a privacy freak uh, and don't want to do that, then you can wait in line. That's a technology that's here now. Doesn't invade civil liberties. It's a simple process to to get that in place. But going back to your larger point, uh, Gideon, about uh, the academy, I think the Kennedy School, at least, has always been concerned about how do you combine the analytical excellence of, of this university with policy relevance. And that's why we did a study on terrorism three years ago, warning about how to reorganize for catastrophic terrorism, why we started a executive session which brought together federal and state and local officials, which Rich Falkenrath ran, to prepare to try to bridge one of these themes. So we've long held that view. But I think your general uh, uh, comment that the academy has not paid enough attention to the real world is probably right. And that uh, I would also argue that the American people have not paid enough attention to the real world outside the United States. Um, it really is a, a uh, appalling fact that uh, over the last decade, you just could not get news. You could not, the foreign news just dried up. And if we're going to be serious about dealing with these issues, we as a people are going to have to become much less complacent and much more knowledgeable about the rest of the world, which is one of the reasons why we have a Kennedy School, which is the most international school at Harvard, with 44% of the student body from overseas. And I often say, and not jokingly, that each of those foreign students is given the job of teaching an American about what the real world is like. On that happy note, let me thank the panelists and thank the audience. And
Thank you.